We're on. All right. Welcome, everyone, to Buckle Your Seatbelt. We're at Blackbird Writers is proud to welcome these thriller authors for our chat this evening. We have Debbie Mack, Avanti Centra, Tori Eldridge, and Rick Trion. Thanks for um, having us. This is yeah. very cool. Yeah, thanks. Debbie is the author of the Sean, Sam McRae series and now the Erica Jensen mystery series. Um, and she writes about uh, Tough as Noel's lawyer who often needs to solve crimes. And, and the, the new one, um, Debbie, I'll let you talk about that. Sure thing. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Erica Jensen is a, a female uh, Marine veteran. Uh, she's back from the wars and um, she is, has, has an opioid addiction and uh, PTSD. So she's suffering from those conditions, but um, she's trying to make a living as a researcher, which is kind of like a, an unlicensed private eye is what she's trying to be. But she wants to clean up her act and become a licensed private eye. And she's yeah. dealing with a probation situation. So she has to mm -hmm. kind of work through that probation to get to that goal. And that's part of her struggle as, as part of the series is always dealing with the, uh, the problems of PTSD and opioids. Yeah. And Rick Trion is the author of the acclaimed Bartholomew Beck series, which includes Let the Guilty Pay and The Price of Silence, as well as two other standalones. And welcome, Rick. Thanks for and, having me on, Tracy. Yeah. Tori is the author of the award-winning finalist for Best First Novel, The Ninja Daughter, a series about Lily Wong, who is dedicated to ninja martial arts and protecting women. Welcome, Tori. Thank you. Yeah. And Avanti. Centra is the author of the Van Op series about Maddie Marshall and her twin brother, Will Argonis, who team up with the Van Ops, which is an ultra black covert agency. Welcome, right. Avanti. Yeah, thanks, Tracy, for hosting. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, th this is such an inspiring group today. So I have a million questions for you, and we're going to have to buckle our seatbelts just to get through one hour. <laughs> Um, Debbie, first, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your inspiration for the, um, for your new Erica Jensen mystery. Be glad to. And let me show you also the cover of the first book. Um, wow. It's interesting because uh, I hadn't planned on writing the second series at all, but I happened to be looking through the paper and I saw this picture of a woman. Uh, it was online, it was, it was a headline online with a picture of this woman who was obviously a soldier or something. And she had this look on her face. It was just haunting. And that picture, that look on her face and the picture just stuck with me. And actually I did a reverse image. I kept the picture. I did a reverse image search on it. And um, it was an actress, I forgot to look it up, I was going to, but it was from the movie Return, which came out in 2011. <laughs> and it was called Return, it was about a returning female soldier. So I thought, oh, perfect, you know, it's like that expression just seemed to say so much to me. And I wanted to write about this person. I wanted to get to know this person and just write about her problems and have her become a sleuth in, in, in the process. So it's kind of a sleuth into her own problems as well as the problems of these people she's working for. And um, she's more of an active kick-ass heroine than Sam. Sam's a lawyer. She tends to think a lot. She'll do the occasional rash thing. But Erica has given me kind of license to do things like, <laughs> you know, punch people, guys, flip them over, you know, things like that when she freaks out over something or 
gets upset, you know, get angry. Get, she gets much angrier than Sam, I think, because <laughs> she's kind of in pain all the time. <laughs> and so she's dealing with that. But, you know, I just thought there were a lot of interesting potential storylines with somebody with this background. And I wanted to present female Marines or female military in general in a way that people would understand and empathize with what they go through. So, uh, I mean, it was quite an education too, just to um, read all the, the stuff that I read to understand the military, the Marines in particular, because they're very, very special. <laughs> Once a Marine, always a Marine. There is no such thing as an ex-Marine unless they kick you out. Um, there are all sorts of little rules about that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's something I kind of dug into and could really get into. And um, it's just kind of freed me up to create a kind of kick-ass female heroine. I love kick-ass female. With flaws. <laughs> <laughs> I love flaws. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, Rick, in your book, Divided States, characters fight a terrorist attack in, um, on what's left of the near future United States. And if you, if you watch the news, it's not hard to imagine something like that occurring in real life. Um, but what's difficult is coming up with the solution. So what, what do you bring to the table when you write? What's your inspiration? Uh, I think you touched on it a lot with the uh, realism. I try to make sure everything that uh, I do uh, either has happened in some you know other way or could happen. And so that does take uh, a lot of research. Uh, and going back to, to what Debbie was saying, uh, yeah, researching the military and how all that works uh, is it takes a lot. And there are a lot of little little things that you learn. Uh, about how movies get things wrong. So you have to maybe read a memoir by somebody who served in Delta or, you know, who uh, was a Marine and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, uh, my skills as a journalist really helped me to do a lot of, I guess, spot research, you know, like whenever I need to really deep, uh, uh, dive deep into something, I can absorb a lot and get it out on paper. Um, and, and for Divided States in particular, I also had to read about how secession might work. There are some, uh, you know, nonfiction books that have explored that and uh, what the ramifications could be. So, uh, you know, I didn't have to come up with that whole cloth. I had some avenues to explore. And obviously I did things a lot more dramatically than might actually happen and a lot more quickly than might actually happen. But, uh, but yeah, doing a lot of uh, research and then making sure that I don't empty the notebook, make sure I don't have five pages on, uh, you know, federal secession law or that sort of thing, you know, uh, you know, putting in exactly what you need, exactly where you need it. That's, uh, that's where, you know, the research becomes fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think, an important point not to get too technical. Yeah. Hey, uh, Tori, you and I were on a panel called Unusual Ways to Kill. <laughs> Um, so tell this audience some of your background and, and the knowledge that you used to write your ninja series. Sure. So uh, my Lily Wong series is about a Chinese Norwegian modern day ninja and protector of women with Joy Luck Club family issues. <laughs> so so there's, a, there's a lot of action. There's a lot of sleuthing, but there's also a lot of cultural family dynamic going on. And I drew a lot from my own background. So, uh, you know, my own heritage, Chinese and Norwegian, uh, but especially from my experience in martial arts. So uh, I got started in Tong Sudo, you know, that's the, that's the art that Chuck Norris did. And, and actually one of my teachers was on his fighting team. And so I used to uh, do private lessons in kickboxing. And another teacher was also very into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So I did some of that as well. And then I discovered Toshindo um, Ninja Arts, which is a modern evolution of an ancient art of the ninja, which are nine lineages passed down for centuries through a grandmaster to another. And now there are thousands of ninja all over the world they're probably in your city right now and they're great people 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I went crazy with that. I, I earned a fifth degree black belt and I used to travel, you know, travel teaching seminars to, um, and also teaching at home, but interesting to what, uh, Debbie was saying and, you know, what Ricky was saying. Yeah. A lot of the people that a lot of the martial arts practitioner, the ninja friends that I taught were in the military. Um, I've got a lot of friends who are in the army and the Navy and the Marine Corps and, um, snipers and uh, law enforcement, CHP. They were students of mine and training partners with me. And uh, yeah, so you, you, get, you get an interesting idea of that. And it's, it's very much, um, you know, it's, it's very much a, a man's world. And it certainly was when I was teaching. And it's just something that, you know, I always felt comfortable, you know, going in there and teaching a, a group of a uh, hundred martial artists and, you know, 98% of whom are men and outweigh me by, you know, a hundred pounds <laughs> and maybe a, <laughs> maybe a foot taller. And, and, you know, and that's just kind of how it is. And so when I write Lily, uh, I really want to bust through the, the myth of sensationalized ninja. You know, we've all seen that in, in movies and television and, and fiction, and it's fun. I dig it, totally dig it, but not what I wanted to show. I wanted to show what a modern day ninja, what that means to those of us who actually train and practice and pursue these ninja arts, which are physical, esoteric, um, you know, strategy, all sorts of things. So, you know, that's what I infuse in there. So I, I go to great lengths to make sure that all my uh, fight and action scenes are as authentic as I can possibly make them. That's awesome. And we should also mention that you had your third book just came out. It did. Tuesday, wow. it dropped. The Ninja Betrayed. So the first two books have Lily in Los Angeles. You know, the first book fighting the L.A. Ukrainian mob and all sorts of things to, uh, you know, save this, these two women and a child. And the second book, The Ninja's Blade, does a deep dive into the commercial sex trafficking of Los Angeles. But the third book, Lily and Ma go to Hong Kong. Ooh. And here's a whole other can of worms because that's where Lily's mother is from. That's where the family business is, Hong Kong international finance. There's all this financial intrigue. There's something else going on. There's, you know, mysteries, there's triads. And there's a guy that <laughs> Daniel Kwok, who her parents <laughs> set her up with, her mother set her up with in the first book, and the grandparents pressured her in the second book, now happens to be in Hong Kong on business. So it's an interesting thing when you have a ninja who has such incredible baggage concerning that sort of thing and, and the murder of her sister and all this stuff coming into dating. It's like she'd rather fight. It's much easier to fight. <laughs> <laughs> that must make it interesting with the love interest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Avanti, your books incorporate more than the usual set of problems when it comes to ancient mysteries and hostile enemies. Your books are full of action and suspense. So what drew you to write about this subject matter? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I wanted to, um, a little bit like Tori, um, I wanted to show a, a female martial artist. So Maddie Marshall uh, studies Aikido, uh, which I studied for a short time in my 20s. Um, and I wanted to show uh, the backstory of how somebody might get pulled into uh, an undercover uh covert operations type of career. When the story opens um, in The Lost Power, Maddie Marshalls, um, she teaches at the local Aikido Dojo, and she's an app designer in San Francisco. And she, she just broke up with her boyfriend and is brokenhearted and um, is uh, just kind of living her life. And her brother, Will, um, who's a tall, dark, curly haired guy, they're twins. Um, and uh, my mom and my aunt are twins. So I also kind of always wanted to explore that twin dynamic and sort of the, the special bond between twins. 
and they um, they show up to their father's house at his request, and uh, he's murdered pretty much right in front of them, and sends them on a, a quest to find Alexander the Great's mysterious Egyptian weapon. Um, so, like uh, one of the characters in in the books, um, Bear Thornson, who is also a Marine, um, like uh, Debbie's character, and like my father, um, he's been fascinated by history and. So I kind of wanted to pull in um, some intrigue, some of that, you know, spy, shoot them up, bang, bang stuff, um, some history. Uh, so we, we talk a lot in these stories about um, either uh, Alexander the Great in the first book or the second book is um, uh, kind of picks up where the second one left off with um, solstice and some of the ancient rituals that people do and some of the, the mysteries that are um, incorporated in uh, some of the, the pyramids around the world and some of the um, you know, fascinating things that uh, people did um, thousands and thousands of years ago when looking at the sky. So I like to pull in um, intrigue, history, some science. Um, in uh, both of these two books, we've got some, um, some modern science uh, pulling on my background as an IT executive, uh, where we've got some, um, the bad guys are wanting to use some science, uh, in, in one case, um, uh, a weapon that can be deployed in the atmosphere and can render your cell phone um, just dripping like a Salvador Dali painting. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got some, some science um, and some mystery. Uh, in, in my case, I'm not really talking about the traditional mystery like the whodunit, um, because we usually figure out um, in my thrillers kind of who the bad guys are pretty early, but um, bigger mysteries. Um, Maddie's uh, afraid of um, small tight places, and, and Will is afraid of heights, and um, the, the mysteries that they have to deal with, um, they have to go through some, um, some tribulations and some trials to, to try to um, uh, make it through um, to, to move along on their quest. And in the second book, we've got these, you know, ancient mysteries. Um, so I, I like to touch on those. So I, I weave in all of those things um, in my stories and just have a have a blast doing it. That's really, really cool. <clears throat> um, and and because you touched on it, you know, the, everybody here, we should let people know in case they don't know what it, what the difference between a mystery and a thriller is. Um, in a mystery, the character solves a crime that has already occurred. And in a thriller, the characters are trying to stop the crime from happening in the first place. So we, we kind of have a sense of what's going wrong and, and our characters have to get there and stop it before. So, um, so with that in mind, how do you know when your character needs help? And how do you know when to involve like government agencies or law enforcement in your thrillers? Who wants to take it? How do you know when your character needs help? Um, uh, Lily Wong books are all written in the first person. So, you know, it's, it's really her doing these things, but she's constantly uh, seeking other help. Like in the second book, The Ninja's Blade, the, that's with the sex trafficking, you know, she, she goes to, you know, to a group, um, to, you know, City of Angels, uh, where, um, where she can gain more knowledge of what's going on in this issue and where she can find it. And she, in interestingly enough, gets led to Hollywood to talk to a teenager who's walking the streets. So she can get information from all sorts of people, you know, not, not just uh, law enforcement, although there is somebody law enforcement in there, is whoever's helping her solve the mystery. See, for me, a thriller is when the character is um, in jeopardy, they themselves is in jeopardy, as opposed to, you know, I'm sitting back and I'm going to figure this thing out, but I'm not in trouble. So a thriller has to have that your main character is in trouble. And that's, that's what I think of in that case. But all of my books are also mysteries because there's something that has to be solved. Um, they're not traditional mysteries. They don't start with a dead body and you're figuring that out. There's something going on and she has to get to the bottom of it. So like in The Ninja Betrayed, her mother is under corporate assault. 
there's something going on in this family run business that is not good. And Lily has to get to the bottom of it. And so she, she finds different partners and different key people in this to use her ninja wiles to get information that will lead her there. Or she has a, a family friend or that she can call or somebody who gives her an in into this world or that world. So she's always finding information and finding help, but it may not be the help that, you know, you were thinking of in your question, you know, like, yeah. when do you call the CIA agent? You know, when do you call Jack Reacher? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not generally, you know, that kind, although she has worked with an assassin and a triad member. So just saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, I think for me, it's it's when my characters are stuck. You know, um, in in the first book, they have uh, they they start getting shot at almost immediately after their father is murdered, and they have to go on the run. Um, and uh, they have very few places to to turn. Um, and so they they end up in in Lake Tahoe, and a family friend meets them um, just we think by accident. Um, and so they, they look to him for help. He's the one that's the Marine. And then they, they go, um, you know, they follow, uh, you know, some direction from their father. Um, in the second book, they've got um, a couple of artifacts and they just don't know where to go or what to do. And they are kind of, they're, they're a undercover version of the CIA. And so they kind of are the good guys, right? So when you're, when you're at that level of elite, you know, you, and you're stuck, what do you do? You know, so they, they research and they find an expert. Um, and it's even kind of joked about because the director of Van Ops, uh, director Bowman, um, tells, uh, agent Thornson, he's like, Hey, don't be afraid to, uh, to ask for help, you know, because you're a guy. So don't, don't be afraid, you know, go ahead and ask for help. And so they, they research and they find an archeo astronomer, um, who's able to, uh, help them figure some things out. So I think it's, um, it's when they get stuck, you know, when their face is against the wall and they don't know where else to go, then they have to expand and uh, try to find somebody who knows more about the situation than they do. That's cool. Then that's, that's kind of what I'm asking too, is when they have to out ask outside agencies. Debbie, does your character ever? <laughs> uh, let's see. I was going to say that Sam McRae is a defense attorney who, I mean, she handles all sorts of cases, but she was a public defender. And so a lot of times she's doing her investigations in connection with people who could be accused of murder or have been accused of murder. And um, so she doesn't look for help from the cops. Uh, she might seek information. She might seek to, to find out what they know and kind of, you know, do what, do the normal sort of uh, preliminary stuff that lawyers do before any kind of legal proceeding, but she's not looking for help from agencies. Um, she does have a private eye that she uses and she has also been known to use like kind of a street thug as an assistant. That's in the second book in the Sam McRae series. She deals with the, uh, Kind of a tough guy from from the streets of DC that you know Prince George's County the DC line that area so um yeah and then I was thinking Erica Jensen well Erica is oddly enough in the second book she becomes a suspect when she finds her own clients butchered in their basement <laughs> basically I don't want to say much more than that uh Let's just say that um, her dealings with the police in the second book that's coming out this November, um, Fatal Connections. Um, in this second book, she really wants to steer clear of the police if, if at all possible. And she's trying to stay out of trouble too. So she finds herself frequently, even though she's a fighter by nature, sometimes she runs from situations just to not get in trouble because She's trying, like I said, to stay clean, keep it all clean, keep her record, you know, as clean as possible, um, all that. And um, so she really just doesn't tend to go to outside agencies, although a very interesting, mysterious man has been following her in the second book. And I don't know where he's from, or she doesn't know at any rate, 
I have a sense of where he's from, but <laughs> uh, he's mysterious and there and helps her out somewhat, mostly baffles her and bothers her and follows her around. <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> so anyway yeah what about you rick i think sometimes uh it can almost be a character arc where your character figures out uh who to trust and um to ask for help because you know a lot of the characters i write uh, tend to be uh loners they pushed other people away that sort of thing so uh, yeah, like uh, learning, you know, who to trust and, and when to ask them for help uh, can be a really big part of the character development. So in addition to bringing in uh, a different skill set so that the action sequences uh, can feel a little bit uh, fresh and you don't get repetitive with that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, mo in most stories, whether, you know, it's a thriller with military or if it's a family drama that... Uh, you know, when to ask for help is a big question that just about any main character uh, should have to deal with. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we touched on this a little bit earlier. You guys were talking about some of your personal backgrounds for writing what you do. Um, but if an author doesn't have any training, um, where do you recommend that they start their research if they want to write an action thriller? Well, I think like Rick said, there's a lot of um, memoirs, you know, uh, Surprise Kill Vanish was one that I recently read, um, a, you know, deep CIA Afghanistan type uh, story uh, written by a journalist. Um, there's, there's just uh, all kinds of those. I have a, one on my bed stand that's um, uh, written from a, a CIA um, person who was a uh, uh, makeup um, artist. Uh, so there's just, you know, besides the information that you can get on the internet, there's, um, you know, a lot of great, a uh, lot of great nonfiction out there. That's a really then, great idea. And then obviously, if you can get uh, interviews with real life people that human intelligence, that's always, uh, always number one. And, uh, you know, if you don't know anybody who ran in those circles, maybe, uh, you know somebody who knows somebody. Um, I rely on that uh, every every once in a while. Uh, also, we talking about stuff on the internet. Uh, one resource that I found that I would never have guessed uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, how military personnel might talk to each other uh, and the lingo they use and how they, um, you know, kind of bust each other's chops and stuff. Uh, Reddit threads. Uh, I found. Because sometimes you ask you ask Google a question and, and, and a Reddit mm. thread is what it comes up with. And I've got a few saved where um, they're commenting back to back and forth. And you really get a sense of, you know, sort of uh, how conversations might go between uh, different members of different military branches and stuff. So uh, obviously I didn't take any dialogue verbatim, but it helps you get a rhythm. Uh, and, you know, the things, you know, the things they make fun of each other about, the things that they, you know, w read between the lines and that sort of thing. Yeah, YouTube videos are, are really great for that too, where, um, you know, you get a couple of hosts and they're bantering back and forth and they're in that world that you're trying to get a sense of. So there, there are two people who are, you know, that kind and, and dealing with that, or maybe even their show is uh, about that. So they're in it and they're talking about that and interviewing people about that. And so that can really, um, be pretty enlightening. And, and that goes for all sorts of things, not just things related to uh, action and oriented like that. Um, also, you, um, there are great um, interviews, like if you're looking from the other point of view, where uh, survivor interviews, people who've been through something, and they're relaying their stories. And, and if you and, and I think, uh, whenever I'm doing research, because I even though these these books come you know, close to me, I do a tremendous amount of research, because I want to have a, a broad swath of what's, you know, different perspectives and, and different uh, experiences so that that I can pull from that and create individual characters instead of, you know, um, like a, a stereotype for something. So I think that really helps. Um, you know, I, people generally love to talk about what they do. 
So, and even people in important situations really like to talk about what they do. And if you're looking for some big agencies, very frequently they have somebody dedicated to talking to people like us about what they do. And so that's super helpful too. I, I would say one more thing when it comes to like Google searches, um, like I was just going through this, um, trying to find something, keep searching it in a different way, a different question different language, because you're going to get different things that pop up. And sometimes it takes days of searching in different ways to finally come up with a gold mine. Yeah, that's really great advice. Really great. Um, some writers may also ask, <clears throat> when should you write from multiple points of view? And, and some of you don't, but uh, a couple of you do write from multiple points of view. Yeah, I've done it once. And so why why would you choose to write from multiple versus from just one character's point of view? It, it really depends on, on the story. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's it really, okay. Yeah, it depends on the story. It depends on the character. Like I have a book coming out in May, which um, is a Brazilian literary horror. And it, it's got a, a very thrilling ending and things going up about that. It has several close points of view because that story needed that. It needed mm -hmm. to have those points of view. It needed to jump and look at things from those different directions and it, and it needed to know things that you know, other characters didn't know. But with Lily, um, when, when she popped into my head, it was very clear that this had to be a first person point of view story, because I wanted people to really relate to her and see this story through her eyes. Now, the challenge gets when you would really wish you could hop into somebody else's, <laughs> you know, point of view so that you could tell this super cool thing and, you know, or this information. And so it gets a little tricky because you have to figure out, okay, how can she get that information that she doesn't know in a way that's interesting and still sticks in the first person? So they both work. And I think it really depends on the story and the vibe of the story you're trying to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Debbie, you were going to say something? That's essentially what I was going to say. It depends on what kind of story you're trying to tell. And sometimes it's um, essential really to tell it from different points of view. For instance, with the one time, the one standalone I've written that uh, was told from different points of view, it was essentially a novel within a novel. The uh, main character is working on a novel and she's working on this thing and she starts to notice that various aspects of her life are imitating the things that she's writing. And she's looking through her novel and making changes and, and starting to see all these similarities. And it's, it's kind of a meta sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, it builds up to this twist at the end that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but um, which book is that? It's called The Plank Factor. And okay. it was inspired by a science book that I read. <laughs> it was inspired by a footnote, which I quote at the beginning of the book, actually about this, how this theory was not going to lead to any kind of big, huge weapon of any sort because of some kind of fat, 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 you know, this factor that was something to do with Planck, you know, P-L-A-N-C-K, the guy Max Planck. <laughs> anyway, um, he's a scientist. Anyway, um, so because of that footnote, it got me thinking, what if they were wrong? What if it was the exact opposite? And this, this could create a huge, horrible weapon. And so she's writing about this. And at the same time, there's a terrorist group that is aware of her and thinks that they are her target and that she's going to reveal stuff about them. And it, so they're coming after her as she's writing about this subject. <laughs> It's it sounds intriguing. It sounds it was, very intriguing. It was like nonstop action. It was like my attempt to write an action movie in a book. <laughs> kind of, sort of. So um, let's see. For all of you, um, does it get easier to write once you've established the series of protagonists? 
or hell does it no. get hard? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, but hell no. I mean, in a sense it does, but you know, you get to know the character, you know, you really can get to know the character when you do a series, but, um, and that I think does help make it a little bit easier, but it doesn't get easier in terms of constructing the plot, right? figuring out how to get them out of situations, how to get them into situations, all of it naturally coming out of their personalities and their choices. All of that stuff is as hard as ever, I think. Anybody else think the same I, thing? I'll, I'll, I'll beg to differ. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll take the, the point counterpoint on that one. Um, yeah, the uh, the third book in the Van Op series, I just sent off to my editor uh, yesterday. And um, I find that the the more I write about the characters, the easier it is for me to um, have uh, character driven um, action and things that happen in the story because of their backstory. Um, so for instance, uh, in, in this one, um, when I was trying to think about what book I wanted to write next, I kept coming back to uh, their mother who died in an accident when they were six. And I kept thinking about, well, gosh, was that really an accident or was it not? And, um, and I went back to the, the backstory of the Van Ops organization and uh, without giving too much away, um, it, it helped me uh, come up with the plot, which I usually do in an outline form, um, by leaning on some of the, the backstories um, of, of the characters. So, so for me, uh, that one was, um, was much easier than you know, trying to learn the characters in the first place in the first story. Cool. Um, Who else wants to vote? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting. It's like, well, the first one uh, took a long time to write. The second one was scary as all get out because of the of the topic, you know, the sexual Sex exploitation of kids. Yeah. And I I needed to get that right. And there was a huge amount of research. So I had to really dig into that. Also, there were teenage characters who were not of my uh, heritage, my ethnic uh, heritage, and I needed to get that right. And so there was a lot of research involved and from that came characters. So fortunately, I had given myself a head start. So before I got the two book deal, I had already fully outlined the second book and written the first seven chapters before I moved on to another part. So thank goodness I had a head start. So it was able to come in on time. Now with the third book, The Ninja Betrayed, it came together really fast. Um, and and I, I, I don't know if it's because it didn't have that, you know, that kind of thing that I had to research and it was in my heritage. But all I knew was Lily and Ma go to Hong Kong family business. And I went for a hike, I, I think on my feet, and I dictated and I came home with a whole bunch of ideas and I wrote it down. And then the next day I went on another hike and I filled <laughs> in all that stuff that goes on in those big middle, you know, sections. Thank and you. I came back and I did all that. And then I plotted it out, you know, like you Avante, I'm, I'm uh -huh. an outliner. I like, you know, acts, I like, you know, all sorts yeah. of stuff, put that together. And it, it really came together pretty great. Now here I am writing the fourth and uh, it's, it's, it's a big book and it's involving uh a family that is not Lily's. Uh, so I have to know that family. And because of the, I don't want to talk about it, but the, because of the nature of the family and the location of the thing, this has involved me going back to research from the late 1800s of this area, this country, and who these great grandparents and whatnot might be so that I have a better sense of who is alive during this story and their interaction and the conflict and, and the plot and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I thought this one was going to be easy. This is the fourth one. I should be like going for a hike, come back, got the book. Yeah, that's not happening. So oh, no. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Rick, what about you? Yeah. Easier, not easier? I would say it makes... It makes some parts of it easier, but I, mm -hmm. I didn't find the entire experience uh, to be easier. And I think a lot of that, you know, what Tori was talking about, it depends on, uh, you know, whatever your story I idea is, uh, how how new is the material you're trying to introduce? Because you know your character, you know a lot of times uh, some of the settings, 
but uh, if if half your book is you know not in the familiar then that half of the book is just as much a struggle as it was to come up with the first characters and all that but uh i i think that maybe to me the revision was a little easier because i did have the characters voices i already knew what they were supposed to sound like and so going back and making that um uh making those changes was a little easier because i didn't have to uh discover the character's voice and discover uh, all that stuff about the character as I was writing. So I think the revision, uh, I would say, probably is easier after after that first book. With the next books, do you guys have any, do you feel any pressure to um, to make that next book even better than the first ones? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, if you're not trying to do that, then, well, you know, I mean, and even with standalones, like, you know, the standalones I've written, I definitely... Uh, always want to try to improve my craft and until I'm making like you know James Patterson money I, th I think that uh, you know that's always uh, going to be something I'm trying to do uh, and then if I'm writing 13 books a week like he does well you know I'm gonna have to I guess I'll, I'll live with that <laughs> <laughs> until then. Yeah, yeah, I'm always, I'm always, you know, looking to, uh, you know, learn and grow and, and stuff and that that's what keeps it all interesting. But I, I try and avoid pressure. So I try not to put pressure on myself, um, you know, for for these sorts of things, you know, so I, I don't, I, you know, that I think that's uh, something that can be kind of dangerous for us, right? Yeah. You know, if we're putting this pressure on ourselves, that we have to be better, we have to, you know, outdo it, or this expectation. I think, you know, if I just focus on the work, and, and I think naturally, I, I get better with every book, you know, I, I'm, I'm learning a thing or two and, and, it, and I get to nice. explore things. And the more I learn, the more I want to explore. And, and I think that's fun. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. You know, one of the things I like to ask my, my editor at the end of uh, revision is what, what can I do better next time? And, uh, and I just like to have, have fun with it. Um, you know, one of the things that she suggested was, cause I do like um, writing multiple points of view. And uh, she said, you know, play with the interplay between the characters, you know, Will thinks this about Maddie and Maddie thinks this about Will. And, and so, you know, you can play with that. And so I, I think it's, um, I think it's fun to, um, continue to develop my craft uh, rather than um, you know uh, any sort of pressure yeah yeah I agree I'm with with Tori on the whole don't get your undies in a bunch over all this um, try not to take any of this too seriously you know in terms of really any of it but just focus on the work and try to do the very best job you can um, Really? Yeah, because writing is hard and the business is stressful exactly. already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. You put enough stress on yourself as it is, just trying to get the work out there and noticed. And writing it, you know, and, and writing it is, is something, you know, you, you have a passion for it, obviously, or you wouldn't be doing it. And, you know, just focus on that passion and pour it into your work. You know, do the research, do the writing do it regularly and try, just try to do the best you can. And that's the advice I always give to everybody. It's like, just do your best. And yeah. don't worry about what other people are saying that you have to do, or this is how it must be, or this is a rule. No, there are no rules, there are guidelines, in my opinion. So, <laughs> yes. and you just, you tell a good story. That's what it comes down to. I mean. Great advice. We have one question from the Facebook chat and uh, Jackie Vick asks, did any of you start out wanting to write a different genre like traditional mystery or did you all start out intending to write a thriller? Oh my goodness, I've written all sorts of things. So I have short stories in horror anthologies, Weird Tales magazine, a, a dystopian apocalypse thing. I've got <laughs> one that's in a, a fantasy. The, the Ninja Daughter, the first Lily Wong book is not the first book that I wrote. The first book that I wrote was a, um, an early um, uh, evolution of Dance Among the Flames, which is the Brazilian 
horror, um, literary horror that's coming out in May. It's completely, I mean, that, that book is about a desperate mother who rises from the slums of Brazil to become a powerful wielder of Quimbanda magic. It covers 40 <laughs> years, three wow. continents, that's and impressive. a past incident in 1560 France. It has gods, <laughs> goddesses, and Brazilian spiritualism and black magic. Okay, so not Lily Wong. <laughs> However, sounds however, great though. I know, right? <laughs> however, I am really, you know, it's like people say, you know, what's your brand? My brand is me. And what I'm, I'm about is uh, empowerment. I love looking at empowerment from the light side, from the dark side. I'm into strong, capable women with agency. Uh, that's something that's going to be showing up in my books. And the other thing is I'm a multicultural woman. You know, that's going to show up. I'm interested in cultures. I'm interested in places and communities, and that's going to show up. So it's different as Dance Among the Flames is from the Lily Wong series and the Ninja Betrayed. If you look at it from that point. Yeah. Okay. It sounds really fun to write. It is fun to write, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Any well, of you guys start out write, wanting to write mystery or something less i have always wanted to write about uh, female detectives always ever since i saw this is dating me honey west back in the day it's an old tv show about a female private eye in the 60s you didn't see them back then and it was like it made such an impression on me both she and mrs peel and the avengers they, to me, were like my role models as a child. So I wanted to write about women like that, the ones who took initiative and took control and all that sort of thing and solved the crimes and fought the guys and won. But <laughs> um, having said that, <laughs> I did actually consider writing science fiction at one point, and I might still <laughs> mm -hmm. work fantasy. Or both. Yeah, I love fantasy, um, but I I didn't want to start there because uh, you know I, I looked at Robert Jordan, who is one of my absolute favorite authors, and thought, oh my God, how on earth could I keep track of that? I mean, the world building that this guy does is mm -hmm. just phenomenal, and I was just way too intimidated. So I thought I'm going to start with something a little, you know, a little more simple, sort of. Uh, um, you know, Da Vinci Code meets Tomb Raider kind of uh, kind of action. Um, I did write a screenplay once uh, about a decade or two ago and some poetry way, way, way long time ago. But uh, when I decided I wanted to write novels, I, I thought I'd start with with this um, before I, I moved on to anything else. Rick, what about you? Uh, I was a reporter, so I, I'm pretty basic. I, I, you know, every every attempted fiction I've ever written has generally been crime fiction of some kind. In fact, uh, Divided States, where nobody was a uh, like an investigator of any kind, uh, was very new for me, where it was uh, more action, more uh, conspiracy and that sort of thing. Um, and so I did that to try to stretch my muscles a little bit to see uh, what other stuff I could write. And I, I enjoyed it. Uh, so I, I feel like I could write different stuff now. And, and it was also almost like a mental hurdle to get over. Like, you know, I knew uh, enough about investigation and enough about, um, you know, crime and stuff like that from just covering the cops beat and doing all that stuff and having talked to people who live in that world. Uh, so I definitely went with the right, which, you know, at the very, very beginning. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the more I've written and the more I know about the craft, uh, I'll, you know, the more I'm willing to uh, try different, different things. And so my goal would be to have some sort of crime fiction, mystery, thriller series. In fact, right now I'm working on a PI uh, novel that I want to turn into a series. Um, but then also work on standalones that uh, are in a very different genre so that uh, hopefully I'll be able to, you know, have a baseline, but then scratch that uh, itch every once in a while when I have something else that I want to write. That's so cool. Um, so um, I I want to I need to let everybody know what you guys are working on next. 
So um, Debbie, what are you working on next? Well, right at the moment I'm working on actually uh, lengthening a uh, Sam McRae short story. It started out as a short story, but I suddenly realized, you know, I could go farther with this thing. I could really get into this situation and turn it into a, uh, perhaps a novella. And what I'm hoping to do is serialize it on uh, Substack. Okay. Um, so, but it would be a Sam McRae mystery and a client comes to her and says, I'm here for a conference. I woke up in my hotel room and there was a dead guy next to me. <laughs> That's how it starts. Sounds great. <laughs> and, and you have, so you have the second book in the, um, in the Erica Jensen mystery is also coming out soon. It's coming out November 11th, Veterans oh, Day. Do you have a cover? Oh, you don't have a cover, right? I don't have it. Yeah, it's not prepared yeah. and nicely, you know, presentable, unfortunately, but I do have a cover that I'm going to be showing eventually. So look for my web, look for it on my website. It'll be up there eventually, debbiemag.com. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Tori, what are you working on? You said you're working on a, a nut, well, the Brazilian. Yeah, yeah. Well, right now I'm in, um, I'm, I'm in the book tour for mm -hmm. The Ninja Betrayed. And next month we're doing a cover reveal for Dance Among the Flames. Yeah. And uh, I just turned in my edits for a, a short story for the Mystery Writers of America anthology, um, Crime Hits Home. And, and that one um, is, is uh, set in Hawaii. So that's, that, was real, that was a real fun. And that, that was much more mystery. Um, but, you know, also a little bit of action. But right now I am deep in this research for the fourth Lily Wong novel. That's that's what I'm about. And as soon as I get off the, you know, the the book tour crazies for the Ninja Betrayed, I'm going to have to carve out some time and just, you know, turn off the Internet and turn off the phones and, you know, get some work done. That sounds great. Um, Rick. So uh, I have a much more complicated answer than probably everyone else. I, uh, uh, I'm done with all of the books that I had that were on the contract. Um, and I actually had to take out uh, a decent amount of time uh, to help start uh, a business, a, a, well, a small press and then uh, an editing service that's kind of uh, separate, uh, but I'm also heading that up. So uh, I had started working on another novel and uh, um, I am still trying to work on that novel, but uh, it would be a new series. Uh, I may uh, write some more of the Divided States type of stuff, but uh, uh, right now I'm focused on a, a new uh, series that I'm trying to start. It's uh, a private eye uh, named Cooper McSwain, uh, who uh, operates here in Amarillo. And uh, right now I've got about 60 pages or so in a synopsis and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I have a couple of uh, agents who uh, have requested uh, that material. So hopefully, you know, that gets uh, picked up and goes somewhere. But yeah, I may not have a new book come out for another two years. So uh, we'll have to see how that goes. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still writing, just uh, not uh, in the same sort of uh, a book a year in a series like most of y'all are doing. Yeah, yes. well, you, you just had two books that came out in within a couple of months of each other. Yeah, yeah, and, and then that's part of it, too. I was working with two publishers and doing two different uh, uh, universes, and so I, uh, I definitely learned that I would much rather go to a book a year clip and uh, do that sort of a thing rather than what I was trying to do, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, um, Avanti. Yeah, so I just turned in the um, the edits for the Doomsday Medallion, which is the third Van Ops book, and um, I've got out on submission uh, a story called Cleopatra's Vendetta, which is a new cast of characters, um, similar uh, action thriller um, with uh, um, a really cool um, uh, 
reach back into Cleopatra and uh, a couple thousand year old uh, war that um, that she uh, was was fighting at the time. And so right now I'm kind of in that magical in between moment where I'm trying to decide what I want to do next. Do I want to do a follow on to Cleopatra's Vendetta? Do I want to write a fourth Van Ops book or do I want to do something completely different? I have yet to decide. Wow. That yeah. leaves everything wide open. I know. It's a world of possibilities. That's amazing. Um, and you guys are also, like every author, I think people should know that every author doesn't just sit, sit around and write all the time. We're yeah. also involved in all of these other little things, right? So tell us what else you have cooking. Besides oh my gosh. Well... <laughs> If you want me to start, I can tell you that I have the Crime Cafe podcast. The Crime Cafe podcast is uh, something that goes up every other week between July, I guess it is, and uh, end of March, April, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And I interview uh, crime suspense and thriller authors on the show. And basically, we just talk about the work and what inspires them and advice to people who would like to write and it's turned into quite a thing I've, i'm booked until 2023 seriously oh, wow. that's great it's absolutely great. astonishing to me <laughs> i can't i guess you it. can't quit <laughs> yeah no i'm gonna have to stick with it yeah yeah um or i will end up disappointing a lot of people <laughs> but um that's wonderful, though. You get to talk to a lot of authors. And... Yeah, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And I learned so much. There's so much information in these interviews. It's kind of like I want to compile them all and just share them with everybody because it's just amazing what people have, the ideas people have, and the different ways that people write yeah. and the different types of this genre that are out there. And they're all very good and very interesting so it's been a wonderful experience especially during the pandemic while everybody else was complaining that they never saw anybody i would see mm -hmm. somebody at least every other week <laughs> at the very great. least <laughs> other than my writing groups i mean oh i also do screenwriting i, I didn't mention my screenwriting i'm constantly tinkering with old Gosh. scripts I'm uh, coming up with ideas for new ones. I actually have an idea for a, a pilot, for a, a comedy pilot. It would actually be kind of a dramedy, I guess. Oh, but it's more comic than drama about a bookstore. And um, I also have another idea for a kind of a thriller movie with a young adult protagonist, female. So, I, I mean, I just have all sorts of things I'm working on. <laughs> We're creative working on a, people. <laughs> I was, so. I, I've done a series actually of, they're, they're up on one of my blogs. Mm -hmm. It's a series of parodies of Shakespeare plays, except <laughs> with um, a female private eye protagonist. Like in the first one I wrote, Hamlet comes to see her <laughs> and says, <laughs> I have a problem. I think uh, my uncle may have killed my dad. I need you to prove that. And she's like, okay, why do you think that? Well, my dad's ghost told me. Oh, really? Uh huh. Oh, Christ, shoot me now. So it takes some convincing. Actually, it takes money. All it takes is money. He plunks some dough down and she says, oh, okay, I got it. And so she's kind of like, you know, this. You know, hard boiled, old fashioned private eye, except that she has a cell phone and it's in modern times. That's fun. But she does the patter of the old style private eye a little bit, you know. We've got a couple of thugs in there, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, or a couple of thugs in, in my version. And <laughs> I thought it was pretty clever. Uh, <laughs> and cool. actually, I did cool. one on. And for that, for Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear. And King Lear, I was alarmed at how much it reminded me of uh, The Big Sleep. I was like, oh my God, King Lear is General Sternwood. Oh my God. And this, she can be Reagan and Goneril. And okay. Wow. Well, you're very, very busy. <laughs> Sounds busy. like, oh my goodness. I keep busy. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. But um, 
it's an interesting thing screenwriting sorry no that's great and mm -hmm. it's great to hear that you're so busy and you're doing like so many different things um rick you said you're editing and mm -hmm. you started that business uh yeah so right now i'm working through submissions uh for blue handle publishing where i'm the editorial director and uh, well, actually, the one I'm reading right now is already, you know, we've uh, already acquired that book. So I'm just, you know, making sure that, you know, the ending isn't a, it's all a dream or something crazy like that. Uh, and then, then I'll start working through other manuscripts. Uh, and then, uh, so we just finalized our timeline and release schedule for 2022 and the beginning of 2023. Uh, so, you know, that's a lot longer term stuff, but uh uh, Book Puma Editing is a separate, uh, you know, sort of uh, company that we started where uh, the editors that we're going to use for Blue Handle, we're going to let other people, if they want to pay for those editing services, well, they can. Uh, that, you know, if you either do one or the other, you either publish, we either publish your book or you can pay for our editing services. It's not a hybrid type of deal. Uh, but I've got about 10 editors that uh, I'm overseeing. So, uh, you know, I'm having, you know, doing quality control on their edits and making assignments and stuff. And, uh, um, you know, we're working on uh, a lot of smaller stuff right now, hoping, you know, that uh, some other people are out there who would like, uh, you know, to, to give us a try. But uh, anyway, that uh, beginning that started actually took a lot more time than I thought it would, because why, why wouldn't starting a bread, you know, a new business be easy? Like, why would that be hard? So, uh, uh, but we're finally, I think, past most of that. Uh, and then uh, as soon as I get back from the Lubbock Book Festival this weekend, I would like to start uh, learning how to write screenplays, uh, because that uh, seems fun. And, you know, I think uh, it might give me a, <laughs> apparently it's not, no. Um, but uh, it is, uh, you know, something else creative so that uh, I think it'll help me balance out those times whenever I feel like I'm working on nothing but writing and reading prose between my job and my other, I think uh, having a different form will help. And I've got somebody okay. I'm partnering up with who has a really good, uh, really good idea for, it's like a YA dystopian uh thing uh we're working on the log line now as you can tell because i couldn't really explain it to you but uh but yeah so that's what i'll be doing you know after after this weekend i'll be uh starting to get a little deeper into that so lots of lots of reading and uh lots of writing <laughs> screenplays awesome. are great uh for I, I i entered into writing through screenplays and yeah, and actually one of them got a, a semi-finalist nod for the Nickel Fellowship. And wow. it, it really helps you with uh, structure and pacing because it's very confined, right? 120 mm -hmm. words, I mean, 120 pages, that's it. Um, and, you know, you have to really just get in there by the, by the first, you know, 30 pages and things. And my husband is a television film producer. And at that time, this was back in the 90s, I was reading a, a whole lot of screenplays and television uh, teleplays for him. And so, you, you know, you really start to, to learn a lot. So I love it when I hear novelists who are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm writing, you know, a screenplay, I'm experimenting with this, uh, if for no other reason than for everything that it contributes to novel writing. Alexandra Sokolov uh, does a, a fabulous, uh, look her up, a fabulous uh, blog about uh, screenwriting tips for novelists. And she's actually written, um, not, um, books uh, as well on that. And I've, I've never taken any of her courses or read her book, but I have read a couple of her blogs and they are so in keeping with, with what I discovered, you know, when I was uh, writing screenplays and how I use that for novels. So if anybody's interested, Alexandra Sokoloff, look her up. As far as, uh, you know, what do we do? I'm an immersive person. I tend to, do, you know, immerse in one thing. When I was doing martial arts, my God, it was raising the kids and it was, you know, being a ninja. And, you know, when I, when I decided I wanted to pursue uh, novel writing as a career, I stopped teaching and I stopped writing and I devoted all my time, my attention, my resources, uh, you know, my energy into this. So, you know, other things that I'm doing is, you know, my God, being my own marketing person, doing my own graphics, doing my own website, uh, arranging my own events, you know, all the articles, all the essays, all of those things. And then, of course, there's, you know, the things that you do to give back, right? Getting involved in writers associations. I'm the um, 
the coordinator for the International Thriller Writers Debut Authors Program. And, you know, and I, and I really, I really love that. And there's a lot of things that I can do, but, you know, there's, there's only so many hours in the day. So there's so many worthy things that I've been invited into that, uh, unfortunately, I've had to, I've had to turn down and anthologies I've been invited into that I had to turn down because I just, I, I, I haven't yet gotten to that Hank Felipe Ryan stage where I can just like be that productive. I'm trying, I'm trying, you know, <laughs> and I'm working at it. But, uh, you know, right now I'm kind of like right here at everything I can handle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I and, and I forgot to mention, Tori it reminded me, I'm also the president of the Texas High Plains Writers. So that's. Oh, uh, see, there you go. Yeah. See, so, yeah, right? I, I totally see what I mean? Forgot. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. a big part of what I do too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Avanti, what else are you involved in? I think Tori and I are evil twins separated at birth because <laughs> <laughs> I'm also immersive. I also come up with great ideas while I'm hiking. I'm also doing all my marketing, um, you know, and maintaining my website. And right now I'm working on the marketing plan for the Doomsday Medallion and, you know, trying to figure out where those resources go, because there's so many ways that you can market a book um, and, uh, you know, hire different publicists, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, it's it's a big job figuring out um you know how much you want to spend where you want to spend it um and uh you know working on you know graphics and this and that and the other thing so um even when i'm not writing i'm doing something i'm i'm reading somebody's book for a possible blurb i'm uh reading um you know books um that are similar to mine in the genre i'm researching the uh the industry uh so there's there's a lot that goes into being an author yeah, absolutely. Well, it was an absolute honor to chat with you guys today. Um, thank you so much for coming to this live event and sharing everything, sharing your knowledge. Um, really great to have you today. Thanks so much, Tracy. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. yeah thank you wonderful. for hosting, Tracy. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank it's you. Been a lot thank of fun. you very, very much. Thank you. You're welcome. And I hope to see you guys around and check out these authors on their websites and all of their books and enjoy reading. All right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.